Hey guys, welcome back. It's Miss Huber. Today we're going to be talking about chapter six for anatomy and physiology. It's going to be over bones and skeletal tissues. Now we briefly talked about these in chapter four, but we're going to build on all of that as this course is designed to do. As always, my dogs are in the background chewing on bones and things like that, so I apologize for those noises, but we're just going to get through this. All right, so we're going to talk about cartilage first. I know that this was talking about bones, but it kind of starts off as cartilage. Okay, so skeletal cartilages. So the human skeleton initially consists of just cartilage. Think about it. Your human skeleton initially, when you were a little fetus before you're born, you're kind of squishy. And even after babies are born, they're kind of squishy and you can't touch their head because it's going to get misshapen. And if you lay them down on their backs all the time, they get like flat head syndrome on the back of their heads, right? It's because you're mostly cartilage, right? It's later replaced by bone, except for the areas like as an adult that you have a lot of flexibility. Okay, so let's talk about the basic structures, types, and locations of these different cartilages. So skeletal cartilage is made up of this highly resistant and molded cartilage tissue that's primarily water, which makes sense. If it's this like flexible material, it's composed mainly of water, which like I said, makes sense. Um, it doesn't contain any blood vessels or nerves. So that's important. We talked about that again in chapter four, right? Um, we have the perichondrium, which is going to be the layer of dense connective tissue that surrounds cartilage, kind of like a girdle. So this is like to keep it in place. So it's a flexible material that's composed largely of water. But like if you, you know, apply pressure to it, it can't expand and go somewhere that it shouldn't. It can't really like move. It is flexible, but it shouldn't change shape or start encroaching on areas that it doesn't belong. So this perichondrium acts like a girdle to kind of keep it where it's supposed to be. So this helps cartilage resist outward expansion. This is where we also have blood vessels for nutrient delivery to the cartilage because it's going to rely on diffusion for that. Okay, our cartilage is made up of chondrocytes, which again, we've talked about previously. These are cells that are encased in small cavities. The cavities are like little tiny holes. That's what a cavity is. And they're called lacunae. Um, and then that's like within the jelly-like extracellular matrix here. Okay, so there's three main types that we're actually going to talk about today. Um, so the hyaline cartilage is going to provide your support, flexibility, and the resilience. Okay, so that's like the flexible part. Okay, um, most this is the most abundant type of cartilage, and it contains only collagen fibers, which is where it's going to get a lot of its like uh, resiliency from. Uh, we can find this in like articular joints, coastal uh, areas like the ribs, um, respiratory tracts, like your larynx, nasal cartilage, like the tip of your nose. That's why it's like flexible and kind of squishy. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about elastic cartilage, which is similar to hyaline cartilage, but it contains elastic fibers. You have this in the outside of your ear, again, pretty wiggly, and the epiglottis in your neck region. And then you have fibrocartilage, which is going to contain a thick collagen fibers, and it has really, really great tensile strength. So it's very resistant to tension. You're going to find this in the menisci of the knee. So if you've ever heard of like an athlete like tearing a meniscus, it's like a, it's a membrane that's in the, the knee and it acts as like a cushion and in your vertebral discs. So in between all the vertebrae in your spinal column. So here's a picture of where all of these collagens are located in your body. So you can see that they're color coded here. You've got the blue, which is the hyaline. Um, you can see we talked about how it's in the larynx and um, the respiratory tracts. You can see that here. You have the elastic cartilage, which like I said, is in the epiglottis as well as in the external ear. So it's these little tiny dots. And then the red fibrocartilage is a little bit difficult to see, but it is between all of the discs of your spine and then also um, located here in your pubic bone, there's a small joint there that has fibrocartilage. Okay, so the growth of these cartilages that we're talking about. So cartilage grows in two different ways. It grows as like appositional growth and then also interstitial growth. So in appositional growth, basically it's growing on existing cartilage, like on the surface of. So cartilage forming cells in the perichondrium secrete matrix against the external face of existing cartilage. So it's just creating more on the surface of what's already there. So new matrix is laid down on the surface of cartilage. And then with interstitial, this is kind of like happening inside of. So the chondrocytes, so the cells within the lacunae, the little holes, divide and secrete new matrix, expanding the cartilage from within. So like inter kind of means like within, okay? So this is happening from like within 
So it's kind of like pushing out. It's like growing from the out, the inside out. Whereas appositional is growing on the surface of the existing cartilage instead of inside of it. So the calcification of cartilage occurs during normal bone growth in youth. And then it can also occur in older age. Um, and our hardened cartilage is not the same thing as bone, but our car uh, cartilage does harden as you get older and you're less squishy and flexible like a little fetus, okay? Um, so this is all leading us to bones because cartilage is kind of like a precursor here. They're, the precursors are all made from fibroblasts, so they're all kind of coming from like the same general cell types. So we're gonna talk about the functions of bones because that's what we're really here for today. So our bones do a whole lot of stuff for us. There's actually seven key functions of bones. So one, support. We're, we are upright beings. We are not little slugs on the ground. So it supports our body and our soft organs. For protection, it protects your brain, your spinal cord, your vital organs. I mean, think about your rib cage. It's literally encasing your lungs that you need to breathe and your heart, which you also, you know what I mean? It's acting as a protective barrier. Okay, then you have movement, which is levers for uh, muscle action, mineral and growth factor storage. So you store calcium and phosphorus and other growth factors in your bones. So it kind of acts as a reservoir for these things. And then you also have blood cell formation happening here. So number five, so you have hematopoiesis, which is occurring in our red bone marrow cavities of specific bones. And we'll get to all of that. You also have um, our triglyceride fat storage in like our yellow marrow. So this is um, fat that's used as an energy source. It's gonna be stored in bone cavities. Like I said, that's yellow marrow instead of the red marrow, which is actually gonna be making your uh, blood cells. And then hormone production. So you have osteocalcin is secreted by bones to help regulate insulin secretion, glucose levels, and metabolism. So your bones actually affect your metabolism, which is pretty neat. Okay, so let's talk about the classification of bones. Now we know what they do, so let's talk about how we classify them. So there are actually 206 named bones in the human skeleton. So that's talking about in adults once all of the bones have grown together. So they're divided into two different groups based on where they're located in your body. So you have the axial skeleton, which is going to be the long axis of the body. And then you have the skull, the vertebral column, and the rib cage being involved there. So my little stick figure man here. Okay, we're talking about the axial skeleton. That's like what's like located centrally. Okay, the appendicular skeleton is referring to like the appendages. So you have like legs and you have arms and your pelvis is also included in this. But the appendicular skeleton is the bones of the upper and lower limbs. And then the girdles that are attaching the limbs to the axial skeleton, which is why your pelvis is included. So those are like the two separate classifications for like the groups based on their location for our bones. So you can see in this picture here that you have the axial skeleton is kind of like this orangey color. So that is like the main area of the, the head and then like the uh, torso essentially. And then you have the appendicular skeleton. Like I said, this is talking about your appendages. So you have your arms, you have your legs and then the girdle that attaches them. So that's how your hips are involved here. Okay, so we also can classify our bones based on shape. And there are four different shapes that our bones can be classified as. So you have long bones, which are long bones. They are longer than they are wide. So these are like kind of, you know, longer bones. This is like the typical, like you're used to thinking about like a dog bone or something like that's like the standard long bone because it is longer than it is wide, right? So these are more like your limb bones. Even like long bones exist in your fingers, even though they're not very long, they are still longer than they are wide. So this does not equal large bones. It just means that this has to be true. Okay, then we have short bones, which are cube shaped. So short little cube shaped bones in your wrists and in your ankles. Um, you have these things called sesamoid bones that are uh, within tendons. So an example is like your patella, which is your kneecap. It forms within a tendon. And all of these short bones can vary in size and number in different individuals. Next, we have flat bones, which are flat, as you might guess. Okay, they're typically curved. We're dealing with like the sternum, which is between your uh, ribs. You have the scapulae or the scapula, which is one shoulder blade, right? Your ribs um, and then the skull bones as well. 
Lastly, we have irregular bones, which is kind of cool. It's like a catch-all, right? So this is like, oh, hey, they didn't fit in the other three groups. Well, here's our fourth one, irregular bones. Okay, so these are complicated shapes. So your vertebrae have very interesting shapes to them. And then your hip bones, of course, like your pelvis, it's kind of like this weird flattened heart shaped sort of bone, right? So um, they, those are definitely irregular compared to our other three groups. So here's some examples of what these look like. So your long bone, you have an example here. Like I said, it's you also have long bones down in your fingers. These are not necessarily large bones. They are long because they are very long compared to their width, okay? And then flat bones are, you know, flat, and they typically have some sort of curvature to them. Uh, you have your short bones, which are cube-shaped, and you have your irregular bones, which are weird. They're just, they didn't fit anywhere else, so that's where they are, irregular. Okay, so bones are organs because they contain different types of tissues. So we've talked about cartilage, and we're talking about bone now, so we're definitely dealing with connective tissue, osseous tissue here. So bone or osseous tissue is gonna predominate, so that's the, the most uh, prevalent tissue type in bones. But bones also have nervous tissues. They have cartilage, which we just talked about, the fibrous connective tissues, muscle cells that are involved here to help move with movement, epithelial cells in the blood vessels, and so on. So we're gonna look at the three different levels of the structure of a bone here. So we're gonna look at gross anatomy, my, the microscopic view, and then the chemical view of bones, like what's going on with the chemistry there. So the gross anatomy of our bones. Uh, we have compact and spongy bone, two different types of bone here. So compact bone is dense. Compact, dense, makes sense. It's a dense outer layer on every bone that appears smooth and solid. The spongy bone, think about a sponge. What does a sponge look like? It's got holes in it, right? It's porous. It's got little holes. SpongeBob, porous is he, right? It's got holes in it. So spongy bone um, is made up of a honeycomb of small needle-like or flat pieces of bone called these um, trabeculae or trabecula for one. Okay, so these are open space. There's open spaces between the trabeculae that are filled with red or yellow bone marrow. And that's where we were talking about some of the functionalities of our bones. And we'll get back to that later. But there's two different types of bone marrow that exist between these little guys, trabeculae. Okay, so we've got the structure of short, irregular, and flat bones coming up next. So the these consist of thin plates of spongy bone, so remember they're, they're spongy, they're porous, covered by our compact bone, which looks smooth, right? So you have kind of like spongy on the inside, smooth on the outside. Okay, so the compact bone is sandwiched between connective tissue membranes called the periosteum, which covers the outside, and the endosteum, which covers the, the inside portion of the compact bone. We'll look at some images in a minute. Um, and then bone marrow, which we just, briefly hit on a second ago, is scattered throughout the spongy bone in no defined marrow um, cavities. Um, we have hyaline cartilage that's going to cover the bone, the area of the bone that's part of a movable joint. Okay, and joints actually comes later in chapter eight for a more in-depth discussion of how cartilage works with our joints. So the point of this here is to show you that it's kind of like a sandwich. So you've got your compact bone out here and compact bone here. And in the middle, you have your spongy bone. And like I said, spongy bones, like they, it's literally like it's got holes in it, it's holy, okay? So it's a sandwich of smooth, and then you have your sponge, and then you have your smooth. So all the smooth stuff is what's going to be actually interacting with the other um, membranes and, and other tissues. Okay, so the structure of our long bones is gonna be a little bit different. So our long bones, all long bones have a shaft, which is called the diaphesis. So like I said, this is kind of like your typical like dog bone sort of scenario, right? So the shaft part, that's gonna be your diaphesis, which is right here, or diaphesis. Um, so then your bone ends are the epiphyses, which are gonna be these parts here, okay? So that's gonna be the epiphyses or epiphysis if we're talking about one part. Okay, and then membranes. So the diaphysis is a tubular shaft, so like the long part, okay, that forms a long axis of the bone. It consists of compact bone surrounding central medullary cavity that is filled with yellow marrow in adults. So remember this yellow marrow, we're gonna, like I said, that has to do with the functionality that we'll get to. Okay, so that is the long central part. 
Then the end parts, like the little like butt looking sections of my bone here that I drew is the epiphyses. So these are the two different ends. Okay, so they're the ends of the long bone that consist of compact bone externally and spongy bone internally. So that's a commonality here. Compact bone on the outside, spongy bone on the inside. Okay, um, we have articular cartilage covering these articular joints, so these surfaces. And between the um, diaphysis and the epiphysis is the epiphyseal line, which is actually just a remnant of our childhood epiphyse uh, epiphyseal plate where the bone growth is actually occurring. And that's more of like in the in the in the, like the middle parts in between them. You can see like a remnant of of the um, epiphyseal plate. So yeah, we can look at that here. Okay, this is a much better picture than when I just drew. So the whole thing is a long bone. So it's the structure of a long bone. This one in particular is the humerus of the arm. So it's the upper arm between your shoulder and your elbow. Okay, and so you have our cartilage up at the top and you have some more down at the bottom. You've got spongy bone that's in the epiphysis up here with the um, compact bones surrounding the outside of everything. Okay, um, your diaphysis is gonna be here in the middle. It's this longer region. Okay, so this is kind of everything that we just talked about here. And then you can see, like I said, this epiphyseal line that is like a remnant from growing when you were a kid. Okay, so this image here is just kind of like a close up and sideways image of like what's happening up here. Okay, so this is like the top, like more of like the joint area where it meets your shoulder. So you have your articular cartilage, that's the blue part. Okay, and then you can see your compact bone. You can see these little rings that we talked about previously when we talked about um, osseous tissue in chapter four. You got your spongy bone. You can see the um, endosteum here is going to be like the inner membrane on our bones. Great. Okay, so we're going to talk more about gross anatomy. So the overall structure of our bones dealing with membranes. Okay, so there are two different types of membranes that we're going to talk about the periosteum and the endosteum. Um, so the periosteum is white. It's kind of like a frosted glass kind of looking layer of tissue. It's a double layered membrane that covers the external surfaces except for the joints. Um, you have a fibrous layer, which is the outer layer that consists of a dense irregular connective tissue that has like, um, this is either Sharpie or Sharpe, depending if you wanna be bougie or not. Um, Sharpe or Sharpie's fibers that secure the bone um, secure to the, to the bone matrix. So it's actually like attaching there. It's a fibrous layer to add some strength. You have your osteogenic layer, which is the inner layer that's going to be like abutting the bone. So like up against the bone and it contains the primitive osteogenic stem cells that give rise to bone cells. Okay. So that's going to be utilized for growth later when we talk about how our bones grow. Okay. And this also contains many nerve fibers and blood vessels that continue on to the shaft through the nutrient um, foramen openings. And then you have your anchoring points for the tendons and the ligaments. So this is all of talking about the periosteum here, which is our first type of membrane. All right, then we have our endosteum, which is a delicate connective tissue that's covering the internal bo bone surface. So we saw this up in that picture, like a couple slides back. And I just pointed out, it's the interior surface. Endo literally means like inside or into, okay? Um, it's gonna cover the um, trabecule, uh, trabeculae um, of the spongy tissue, which, let me just go back to it real quick, which is what we were looking at here. It's covering the internal surfaces there of our spongy tissue or spongy bone tissue. Okay, and um, we have lines of canals that pass through these compact bones. And like the periosteum, it contains osteogenic cells, which again, give rise to our bone cells and um, that can differentiate into other types of bone cells. Okay, so here's the structure of the long bone, the humerus of the arm. This is just a close up version of just the, the middle region here. So you can see the endosteum here is the internal membrane. You can see that we have the periosteum, which is gonna be like, it's like peeled back. It's like lighter blue color that's on the outside. Okay, you can see that you have your compact bone with those concentric rings. That's a dead giveaway. You have your spongy tissue that's in the middle. Okay, you also have like a, a hollow area here that is filled with yellow bone marrow. Okay, and then those lovely um, 
perforating fibers or Sharpe because I like to be bougie. These little fibers that help to attach the periosteum to the actual compact bone itself. And then a nutrient artery that's going to help um, get minerals and um, oxygen, things like that to our bone tissues here. Okay, so hematopoietic uh, tissues in bones. So we have red marrow. So red marrow in your bone marrow, red, you're gonna think red blood cell because it's gonna help us make blood. Okay, so red marrow is found um, within trabecular cavities of our spongy bone and dipole of our flat bones, such as the sternum. So in newborns, you have these um, medullary uh, cavities and all of the spongy bone actually contains red marrow. Okay, that's gonna help us make our blood cells. So in adults, red marrow is located in the heads of the femur, which is on your leg, the big bone between your knee and your hip, and humerus, which is the big bone in your arm between your elbow and your shoulder. Okay, so um, so in adults, we have the red marrow located in the, the femur and the humerus, uh, but most active areas of hematopoiesis are in the flat bone, dipole, and some irregular bones like your hip bones. Um, actually, if you ever need a marrow sample um, or a marrow biopsy, they will take it from your hip bone which uh, is kind of awful. They like take this big like needle thing and like drill it into your hip bone and remove a section of it to test out your bone marrow there. Um, yellow marrow can convert to red marrow if a person becomes anemic, because again, the red marrow is going to help to produce different types of blood cells, whereas your yellow marrow is going to be like a fat storage facility. Okay, so bone markings. So again, we're looking at the overall image of our bones. So the bone markings is going to be very evident from the outside of our bones here. So um, we have bone markings that symbolize like the sites of um, where muscles are attached, ligaments, tendons, um, attachment to the external surfaces. And we also have areas that are involved in joint formation or conduits for blood vessels and nerves. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of uh, bone markings. There's three different ones. We have projections, depressions, and openings. So projections are an outward bulge of the bone. Okay, so this may be due to an increased stress from muscle pull or is a modification for joints. Um, then you have depressions, which think about like a dip, like a depression is like a bowl or a groove like cutout that can serve as a passageway for vessels or nerves and also plays a role in joints. Again, joints is going to be a huge topic for chapter eight. Um, and our last one here is the opening. So it's a hole or a canal in the bone that serves as a passageway for blood vessels and nerves. Okay, so there's all these different bone markings here that are summarized in the, um, the tables that you see here. Okay, so I'm just going to let you actually go through and, and read those. Do you have the name of the different types of markings and all of the pronunciations there? You also have a description and illustrations of all of these. Like I said, I'm, there's a lot of them, so I'm going to let you go through and you can read them. They're also in the textbook itself. Okay, um, we're going to get into the microscopic anatomy of bone. So this is going to be talking about the cells that make up our bone. So the cells of the bone tissue, there are five different ones that we're gonna be talking about, um, each of which has a special role. Um, they come from the same basic type of cell, but they all have a specific job that they do. So you have osteogenic cells, you have osteoblasts, osteocytes, you have bone lining cells and osteoclasts. Now some of these sound very similar, so it's gonna get a little hairy here as we continue on. Okay, so our osteogenic cells are also called our osteoprogenitor uh, cells. So that's like where other cells are going to come from. Okay, so they are mitotically active stem cells in the periosteum and the endosteum. So mitotically active means that they are dividing. Because remember that mitosis is cell division. They are dividing cells. So if they're actively doing this, then that means that they're generating new cells all the time. And if they're stem cells, that means that they can create the different types of blood cells, or I'm sorry, of bone cells. So when stimulated, they differentiate. That means that they can become different cells into osteoblasts or bone lining cells. So that's two different types of cells there. And some remain as um, osteogenic stem cells, because if you don't have them remain this, then like, how are you going to make all these other cell types, right? Okay. So our osteoblasts. Okay, these are bone forming, bone forming. So I like to think blast, the B, build. Okay, osteoblasts build bone. See all the Bs, they match. Blasts build bone. Okay, bone forming cells. 
rude, that secrete unmineralized bone matrix called the osteoid. Okay, the osteoid is made up of collagen and calcium binding proteins. And collagen makes up um, about 90% of the bone protein that's present here. And osteoblasts, again, bone building, are actively mitotic, which means that they're currently, like, they're undergoing cellular division and you're making more of them all the time. Okay, so you have your osteogenic cell, which is your stem cell, which can then differentiate into an osteoblast. So this is the matrix synthesizing cell responsible for bone growth. Remember the B, the bone building, right? Building bone blast. Okay. Next, we're gonna talk about osteocytes. So these are mature bone cells in the lacunae or the little openings in the bones that no longer divide, no longer divide. So mitosis is a no-go, they no longer divide. Okay, they maintain the bone matrix and act as stress or strain sensors. So they respond to the mechanical stimuli, such as increased force on the bone or weightlessness. And they also help to communicate information to the osteoblasts, which remember are responsible for building bone, and osteoclasts, which we'll talk about in a second. Osteoclasts destroy bone. Okay, so bone remodeling can actually occur. And bone remodeling is something that's happening all the time. Bones are being built and, and demolished, all alternating processes all together, all the same, you know, all the time. Okay, four, we have our bone lining cells. So these are flat cells on bone surfaces, because what do they do? They're bone lining, so they're on bone surfaces. That makes sense. Believed um, to also help with the, the maintenance of the matrix along with our osteocytes. And then on the, they are on the external bone surface. The lining cells are called periosteal cells. And on the internal surface, they are called endosteal cells, which makes sense because you have your um, periosteal uh, membrane, which is gonna be on the outside of the bone and your endo, um, your endo membrane, which is gonna be on the inside. Because remember this means in and your um, perio is gonna be on the outside. Okay, yay, our last one, osteoclasts. Okay, so these are going to help to break down our bones, okay? So they're derived from the same hematopoietic uh, poetic stem cells that become macrophages. They are giant and multinucleated um, cells that function in bone resorption and the breakdown of bones. I like to think the C, like I said, the B was build. The C, I'm gonna say crush, bone crushing. So osteoclasts break down bone. I don't want you to think break down because I don't want you to get that B terminology stuck there. So we're gonna think osteoclast is gonna crush the bone. And if you're crushing it, you're gonna deteriorate it because I don't wanna use the word breakdown, okay? Um, and then your blasts are what builds it back up, okay? So when these are active, the cells are located in the depressions called resorption bays. And then you have cells, uh, these cells are gonna be uh, ruffled borders that serve to increase the surface area for enzyme degradation of the bone. So instead of having that smooth bone, it's now creating these ruffled borders. So like they're more like jaggedy. And so you're doing this to increase the surface area. Okay, you're increasing the surface area for enzymes to go in here and you know attack all of these little cells that are now visible because you've increased the surface area to help break it down so you can build it back up. Okay, so the osteocyte is the mature bone cell that monitors and maintains the mineralized bone matrix. So that's gonna be dealing with the matrix and the osteoclast, remember we're thinking clast, crush. Okay, and when we're dealing with blast, we're thinking build. Okay. Um, next, we're going to talk about the compact bone, the anatomy of the compact bone. So remember, that's the smooth bone. Uh, we also have, it's also called a lamellar bone, and it consists of the osteon or the haversian system. Um, you have canals and can canaliculi, these words I'm telling you, who made that? The, you, this is crazy. Um, you also have interstitial and circumferential lamellae. We're going to get into all of this. So our compact bone is made of, it's also called lamellar bone and it has all of these components. Okay, so the osteon, part of the Haversian system. An osteon is a structural unit of compact bone. Okay, so it's just a unit of compact bone. So this consists of an elongated cylinder that runs parallel to the long axis of the bone. 
Okay, so it acts as a tiny weight-bearing little pillar for our bones. So an osteon cylinder consists of several rings, those are those like concentric rings that you're used to seeing, um, rings of bone matrix called lamellae. And lamellae uh, contain collagen fibers that run in different directions and adjacent rings. Um, this helps to withstand stress and resist twisting. And then um, our bone salts are found between the collagen fibers here that are running um, in adjacent rings. So here's an image of this. This is a single osteon. Okay, so there's a twisting force here. So they're actually called like twister resistors because it's helping to like resist this force. Um, so basically you have like these concentric circles. So it's kind of like Russian nesting dolls that you have all these different lamellae or these like different layers to the bone. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the canals and the canaliculi. So we have central or haversian canals that run through the core of the osteon, and these are gonna contain the blood vessels and the nerve fibers. So if you look up here, this is the osteon we just talked about. This is kind of like the area that we're gonna be discussing, right? So it contains the uh, blood supply as well as the nerves. Okay, and then you also have perforating canals or Foxmann's canals, and this is like, a, like an F because Germans are fancy. Um, so these are canals that are uh, lined with endosteum that occur at right angles to the central canal. So these are going to connect the blood vessels and the nerves of the periosteum from the outside, um, the medullary cavity and the central canals that are going to be like on the inside. Okay, so you also have these little guys called lacunae that are small cavities in our osteocytes. So they're like little tiny pores or little holes that are in our osteocytes. Um, you have canaliculi, which are hair-like canals that are going to connect the lacunae to each other and to the central canal. So these are like little connector pieces, okay? And then we have our osteoblasts, remember B, we're building, um, that secrete bone matrix to maintain contact uh, with each other and osteocytes via cell projections with gap junctions. So this is all how we're connecting all of these different cells together, how they're able to communicate and interact with each other. Um, when the matrix hardens, the cells are trapped. Um, when the matrix hardens and the cells are trapped, the canaliculi form. So remember that these are our little connections. So when our cells are close together, they're creating these little canaliculi that are going to be um, little hair-like canals that connect all of these different cells together, all these little pores together as well, which helps to um, increase our communication between the osteocytes of the osteon and permit nutrients and waste products to be relayed from one cell to another. So like I said, it's allowing like kind of like a little transportation highway to allow uh, nutrients and waste to be moved from one cell to another. Think about like a canal is like, you know, like water, like it's moving things. You think about like the canals and the canaliculi like that. Okay, so next we have the interstitial and circumferential lamellae. So the interstitial lamellae, it's um, lamellae that are not part of the osteon. So we have some, um, some of them are going to fill gaps between the forming osteons and others are going to be uh, our remnants of the osteons cut down by bone remodeling. And remember that bone remodeling is happening all the time. Okay, you also have your circumferential um, lamellae, which are, um, deep to the periosteum. So remember that the periosteum is going to be like the outer um, surface, outer membrane on our bones. So this is just deep to them. So it's actually not within the bone tissue, but it's between this membrane and the bone tissue, um, but superficial to the endosteum, which is the internal membrane. Um, these are layers of the lamellae that extend around the entire surface of the um, diaphysis. Okay, or the diaphysis. Um, so this is going to help the long bone resist to twisting. So twister resistor, that's what it says in your textbook. Okay, so here's a microscopic anatomy of our compact bone here. So you can see the spongy bone is still in the center. Your compact bone is on the outside here. You can see your central or haversian canals are highlighted here for you. You can see the um, overall osteon is like that whole section of uh, concentric rings. And this is like a popped out version of what these little concentric rings would look like. Think about like wrapping paper. If you try to like wrap it up and then you don't like put something around it like Velcro or string or something and like it starts to like unwind or something. This is kind of like what that looks like, right? Um, it's showing you all the lamellae, the different layers. You can see the perforating uh, Folksmann uh, canal here. You can see all of the endosteum, the interior linings. 
Okay, and then of course on the outside, you can see your periosteum, the outer lining, you can see all of the different um, perforating fibers and everything that exist between the interior and the exterior here. And then it shows you some more like close up views down at the bottom of our uh, lacunae, the little holes within the osteocyte and things like that. Okay, so that was all about compact bones. Now we're gonna get into our spongy bone. So spongy bone, it appears uh, poorly organized compared to our compact bone because it kind of looks like a like a weird funnel cake kind of okay So it appears poorly organized in comparison, but it's actually organized um, Along the lines of stress to help the bone resist stress Because you don't want your bones to break just because they're you know, you're carrying something heavy you're weightlifting You're doing you know, you stomp your feet and you apply extra pressure, right? You don't want your bones to crack because of that um, uh, You have trabeculae that are little cables on it like uh, like cables on a suspension bridge, they're very highly organized because if you have the cables on a suspension bridge arranged in an inappropriate manner, the weight's not going to be evenly distributed and then the bridge is going to fall and all the people on it are going to die. So it's it doesn't appear to be as organized as our other bone tissues, but it, it is, okay? Um, we have no osteons present in our spongy bone, um, but the trabeculae, uh, do contain irregularly arranged lamellae and osteocytes interconnected by caniculi. Remember that caniculi are like our little channels for transportation between these different cell types. We also have capillaries in the um, endo and end osteum, and these are going to help to supply nutrients because remember your capillaries are little tiny blood vessels that are going to be allowing um, diffusion into our uh, spongy bone here because the bone itself doesn't actually have blood vessels. Okay, so this is that same picture that we looked at earlier. Again, just to remind you that we have our spongy bone, the trabeculae are gonna be all of these like little like, it's the part that actually exists. <laughs> so it's not the whole, uh, it's gonna be the, the little, you know, like bridges that exist to bridge the gaps there. Okay, and we're gonna get into our chemical composition of bone because we looked at the um, you know, cellular, we looked at the gross anatomy, now let's actually talk about the chemical structure of your bones. So your bone is made up of both organic and inorganic compounds. Okay, so our organic compounds are um, osteogenic cells, your osteoblasts, B for building, osteocytes, the bone lining cells, osteoclasts, C for crushing, and the osteoid. Okay, the osteoid, um, which makes up one third of organic bone matrix is secreted by osteoblasts. Okay, because remember that those are building cells. So this consists of a ground substance and collagen fibers, um, which contribute to the high tensile strength and flexibility of bone. Okay, don't think about bone as being like super flexible, but it does, it is extremely, uh, has extremely high tensile strength. Okay, so like I said, you, you can carry things, you can lift weights, you can uh, stomp your feet and do all kinds of crazy things like climb mountains where you increase the pressure on your body at all times. You know, the higher you go up into the atmosphere, you are, um, you know, you are testing that tensile strength, right? And uh, the osteoid and our organic components here are going to help us have that tensile strength in our bone tissues. So let's see, um, organic components. So we're going to continue talking about that. So the resilience of our bone is due to the sacrificial bonds. Okay, so think about what a sacrifice is, like for the sacrifice for the greater good. So that's kind of what's happening here. Um, so the sacrificial bonds um, in or between our collagen molecules that stretch and break to dissipate energy and prevent fractures. So these are little bonds that are constantly made and broken in order to prevent fractures in your bones. Um, if no additional trauma ensues, then the bonds reform. So they're sacrificial. So they're the ones that are breaking instead of your bone. That's why they're called sacrificial bonds. Okay, and then the inorganic component, um, you have hydroxyapatites, which are mineral salts. They make up about 65% of the bone by mass, and they consist mainly of tiny calcium phosphate crystals um, in and around collagen fibers. So these are responsible for the hardness and the resistance to compression. You cannot squeeze a bone to make it smaller. Okay, um, so inorganic compound uh, components continued. You have the bone is half as strong as steel. Think about that, half as strong as steel in resisting compression, and as strong as steel in resisting tension. Okay, and um, 
this happened this lasts like way after death because of these mineral um the mineral composition of the bones so even after you're dead you still have all of these like mineral storages that you know stores that are in your bones that allow this you know resisting of resistance of compression and tension to still be applicable to your bones even after you're dead and this is how we're able to reveal information about these ancient people we're able to see like oh like this civilization from a billion years ago had arthritis and you can tell that because it actually changes the structure of your bones and because your bones are not degraded over time like the rest of your body we're able to study that so it's really cool to see you know like in fossils and not just humans but other organisms you know you can tell a lot from their bones because they're so well preserved because of this mineral composition it's pretty neat Okay, so next we're gonna be getting into bone development. We talked about the structure, we talked about the functions, we talked about the cartilage, it's kind of like our precursor from our fibroblast to help us um, create bone, right? And now we're gonna be talking about bone development. So ossification and osteogenesis is the process of bone tissue formation. This is how bone is formed. So it's the formation of bony skeleton and it begins in the month two of development. So this is when you're still being cooked the bun in the oven, okay? Um, so postnatal bone growth occurs until early adulthood. So this is when you're born, right? But it starts when you're just barely created, right? Um, so bone remodeling and repair are lifelong. So like I said, this is the constant making and breaking of different um, sections of your bones that's happening all the time. Okay, so up to about eight weeks, your fibrous membranes and hyaline cartilage of the fetal skeleton are replaced with bone tissue. Okay, so that's like about the two month mark. You're starting to replace that with bone tissue. You have your endochondral ossification, which is when you have the bone forms by replacing hyaline cartilage. Okay, so remember that you were initially a whole bunch of cartilage and you're starting to create bone by re replacing that cartilage. And the bones are called um, cartilage bones. Makes sense, you're replacing cartilage with a bone. Okay, and this is, um, it's going to help, this is how this process forms most of our um, skeleton. You also have intramembranous ossification, which is when you have the bone developing from fibrous membranes, and these bones are called membrane bones. You see, you're really creative as scientists with naming these. It's a membrane bone because it came from a membrane, okay, whereas the uh, cartilage bone came from our cartilage. Very creative. Okay, um, so endochondral ossification, this is when we have the, um, the formation essentially of all of our bones that are inferior to the base of the skull, except for the clavicles. So from, you know, the base of your head down, except for your clavicles, which are your collarbones, right, in like right in front of your shoulders. Okay, and that's the process, the um, endochondral ossification is what's going to create all of it, you know, inferior to and except for. Okay, so this begins late in month two of development. So like I said, we're talking about like eight weeks in, into development here. So it's going to use previously formed hyaline cartilage. So like we just said, um, we're going to turn that cartilage into bone and it's going to require the breakdown of hyaline cartilage prior to ossification. So it begins as primary, uh, begins at a primary ossification center in the center um, shaft. So the blood vessels are going to infiltrate the perichondrium and convert it into the uh, periosteum. Uh, the mesenchymal cells are going to specialize into osteoblasts. Remember that the B is for building, okay? So these are like our precursor cells, our connective tissue precursor cells that are going to um, specialize into our osteoblasts to create a whole bunch of them, which are going to help to create bone. Okay, so the five main steps of the process of ossification are creating bone. So we have number one, the bone collar forms around the diaphysis of the cartilage model. And then two, the central cartilage of the diaphysis calcifies and then develops cavities or holes. And you have the periosteal bud that's going to invade the cavities, leading to the formation of our spongy bone. Um, and the bud is made up of blood vessels, nerves, red marrow, osteogenic cells, and osteoclasts. Remember, C class is going to be crushing to tear it down. Um, then step four, your uh, diaphysis is going to elongate. The medullary cavity is going to form. You have secondary ossification centers that start to appear in the epiphyses, which remember are the outside parts of the bone. 
Okay. And your epiphyses are going to ossify. So the hyaline cartilage is going to remain only in the epiphyseal plates and articular cartilages, which are going to be, you know, like on the, um, the most polar regions of the long bones there. So here's an image of all of that, right? So we just went through all these steps of the bone collar forms, which you can see here. Okay, around the um, diaphysis of the hyaline cartilage model. So the blue part's the hyaline cartilage. You have the cartilage in the center of the diaphysis is going to calcify, and then it's going to develop cavities. Cavities are little tiny holes. Okay, so you have the deteriorating cartilage. Um, three, you have the periosteal bud is going to invade the internal cavities, and spongy bone is going to form. So we have our spongy bone here. I told you it kind of looks like a weird little funnel cake. Um, number four, the diaphysis is going to elongate. It's definitely increasing in length. Um, and the medullary cavity is going to form. So you can see that here. It's a cavity. It's a hole. It's this open space in the center region. Secondary ossification centers are going to appear in the epiphyses, which are here and here. Remember that that's like the end of the bone. Okay, the epiphyses are going to ossify or, you know, become bone. Um, and then when completed, the hyaline cartilage remains only in the epiphyseal plates and the articular cartilages. So you can see that on the outside here and here, and then you have your epiphyseal plates. Okay, so next you have the intramembranous ossification. So this is going to begin within the fibrous connective tissue membranes that are formed by mesenchymal cells. And remember that that's just the precursor to our connective tissues. So it's going to form the frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal, and clavicle bones. Okay, so here's how this happens. There's four main steps that are involved in this process. So the ossification centers are formed when the mesenchymal um, cells cluster and become osteoblasts. Again, B for building, because we're building cells here. The osteoid is secreted and then calcified. Uh, you have woven bone that's formed when the osteoid is laid down around the blood vessels, resulting in a, a trabeculae. And then the outer layer of the woven bone is going to form the periosteum, which is that outer membrane. Okay, then you have the lamellar bone is going to replace the woven bone and red marrow is going to begin to appear. So this is the process that we have here. This is intramembranous. So this is inside of the membranes. These are membrane bones that we're forming. Everything that we just said. So one, your ossification center appears in the fibrous connective tissue membrane. The selected centrally located mesenchymal cells are going to cluster and differentiate into osteoblasts for bone building, forming an ossification center that produces the first trabeculae of spongy bone. And two, you have your osteoid being secreted within the fibrous membrane and it's going to calcify. So the osteoblast continues to secrete osteoid, which calcifies within a few days. And then trapped osteoblasts become osteocytes, which are just involved in maintenance of the bone matrix. Then for three, you have a woven bone and periosteum forming. So you have the accumulating osteoid is laid down between the embryonic blood vessels in a manner that results in a network of trabeculae called a woven bone. And then you have vascularized mesenchyme that's going to um, condense on the external face of the woven bone and become the periosteum, the outer coating. Okay, and then four, your lamellar bone is going to replace the woven bone just deep to the periosteum, which is that outer coating, and your red marrow starts to appear. That's so rude. She's trying to get a bone. Get it? She's trying to get a bone. <laughs> anyway, um, your trabeculae just deep to the uh, periosteum is going to thicken. The mature lamellar bone starts to replace them, forming compact bone plates. Your spongy bone, the innermost part, um, consisting of the distinct trabeculae um, persists internally and its vascularized tissue becomes red marrow to help us make um, blood cells. Okay, so postnatal bone growth. So this is after you have developed postnatal. So after you were born until early adulthood, you have postnatal bone growth. So long bones grow lengthwise by interstitial or longitudinal growth of the um, epiphyseal plate right? So your long bones are going to continue to get longer because you are much taller today than when you were born. And thank goodness for that. Okay. So your bones are going to increase in thickness too through appositional growth. And then your bones stop growing during adolescence. So it's different for everyone because you reach adolescence at you know, varying times. And some facial bones continue to grow slowly throughout your life. So the growth and length of uh, long bones. 
So interstitial growth requires the presence of an um, epiphyseal uh, cartilage in the epiphyseal plate. So the epiphyseal plate is going to maintain that constant thickness and the rate of the cartilage growth on one side is balanced by bone replacement on the other side to keep it, you know, balanced. So the epiphyseal plate consists of five different zones. Here you have the resting or the quinescent zone, the proliferation or growth zone, the hypertrophic zone, calcification zone, and ossification or osteogenic zone. Okay, so here's a little bit about each of those zones. We have five of them. So the resting zone is the area where the cartilage on the epiphyseal side of the epiphyseal plate is relatively inactive because it's resting. That makes sense. Okay, two, you have your proliferation, which is growth. So the area of cartilage on the um, diaphysis uh, side of the epiphyseal plate that's rapidly dividing because it's growing, makes sense. New cells are formed and they're going to move upward, pushing the epiphysis away from the diaphysis and it's going to cause lengthening because we are growing, we are lengthening our long bones. Uh, next, we have our hypertrophic zone, which is the area where the older chondrocytes um, closer to the uh, diaphysis, so that's like the, the central part. So we have the cartilage lacunae that are going to enlarge and erode, forming an interconnected space um, here in our bones. And then the calc calcification zone is surrounding the cartilage matrix. It's going to calcify. The chondrocytes are going to die and deteriorate. And in our last step, we have the ossification zone here. This is where the chondrocyte deterioration is going to leave long um, little like spines of our calcified cartilage at the epiphysis and um, diaphysis junction. So where they're meeting, remember that that is just referring to, you know, where they're meeting. So here and here, because remember that this is referring to this and this is referring to the end pieces. Okay, so the um, spicules are then eroded by osteoclasts, remember to crush clasts, and are covered with new bone by osteoblasts, which are going to be our building cells. Okay, and ultimately our, um, it's replaced with spongy bone and our medullary um, cavity is going to enlarge as our spicules are eroded. Okay, so here's all these different zones. So this is the growth and the length of a long bone is going to occur at the epiphyseal plate. Okay, so these are all the different zones that we're talking about. So this is actually just this little tiny like ridge that we have here. So you have our different zones and all the different jobs that are happening within this plate in order to grow our long bones. Okay, so continuing on with the growth of our uh, long bones, how they're lengthening. Um, near the end of adolescence, your chondroblasts are going to divide less often. Remember that the blasts are building. Okay, your um, epiphyseal plate is going to thin and then it's replaced by bone. So you're actually not going to be lengthening your bones anymore. Um, your epiphyseal plate is, um, closure is going to occur when the epiphysis and the diaphysis are going to fuse together. So the shaft and then the two ends are going to actually fuse together. Um, bone, length, bone lengthening ceases for females usually around 18 years of age, whereas males, they grow a little bit longer um, to 21 years of age. And then we also increase the thickness of our bones. So we've been talking about the length, but we also increase the, the thickness of our bones, the width. So growing bones um, widen as they lengthen through appositional growth. So this can occur actually throughout life. So the bones are going to thicken in response to the increased stress from muscle activity or added weight. So as you're, you know, growing, um, the osteoblasts beneath the peri uh, periosteum are going to secrete bone matrix on the external bone. And we have our osteoclasts are going to remove bone on the um, endosteal surface. And then... So our bones are also growing wider or thicker as they're growing longer. So we have the um, widening occurring as they lengthen through appositional growth, which can actually occur throughout the li your lifetime. The bones are going to thicken in response to the increased stress from muscle activity and added weight because, you know, you're growing. 
Um, osteoblasts are building cells or beneath the periosteum are going to secrete bone matrix onto the external bone. The osteoclasts, the bone crushing cells are going to remove bone on the um, endosteal surface. And usually more buildup than breaking down is going to occur, which leads to our thicker and stronger bones, um, but still not too heavy. So this is kind of like our picture to go with our long bone growth and remodeling during youth. So you have the bone growth and the bone remodeling. So you can see all of this, the, um, the same, uh, goodness, main players that are labeled here that you got your cartilage up at the top. You have your um, epiphyseal plate. Um, and remember that in bone remodeling, you're going to have the bone that was uh, resorbed and um, appositional growth that's going to add bone. That way it's changing the thicknesses of the bone. So we're about halfway through this and it's already kind of long. So I'm going to pause here at the hormonal regulation of bone growth. And we will pick up here next time. Um, so please come back to finish this up for hormonal growth. And we'll get into more of like the development, develop, developmental aspects of the uh, skeleton as well. Thanks for joining me so far.